Hello, and welcome to part two of microbial metabolism. We're going to talk real quick a little bit about enzymes. Enzymes are a class of proteins known as biological catalysts. Uh, they are proteins that interact uh, or are part of a reaction, uh, and they will bring reactants together or um, actually cause a reaction to occur on a single molecule by binding to it. Uh, they will cause a chemical reaction to move forward. And uh, this will move forward at a faster rate than the reaction would occur without the catalyst. So they work like a catalyst uh, in chemistry. Uh, when an enzyme binds to something, what an enzyme binds to is called its substrate. So an enzyme binds to a substrate. I'll get my pen here so we're uh, able to write. So an enzyme plus its substrate is going to result in a, um, in a final product. Enzymes are important in metabolism because they are the functional units that carry out metabolic pathways of different types. They do this by breaking things down uh, in catabolic reactions, building things down in anabolic reactions or in biosynthetic pathways. Sometimes an enzyme may require energy in order to function, may, sometimes it will not. But what makes enzymes work so well is that they are highly, highly specific. What an enzyme binds to is very, very unique to that enzyme. How do enzymes do what they do? Well, as a biological catalyst, they make reactions move forward, and they do this by speeding up the reaction, and they speed up the reaction by lowering what's known as the activation energy. Now, reactants, when they come together, do have a given amount of energy, and how much energy is within these reactants in order for a reaction to occur between them is known as the activation energy. So how much energy has to be present for these two molecules to react with each other or for something to happen, a bond to break or a new bond to be made? Enzymes lower that amount of energy. So we have much more, um, much, I'm sorry, we have much less activation energy required for a chemical reaction, a biochemical reaction to move forward when an enzyme is involved than when we don't have an enzyme. So in essence, they function by lowering the activation energy. Now, they do this by uh, twisting or weakening bonds, uh, sometimes referred to as tweaking a bond, uh, bending a chemical bond between two atoms and a molecule to weaken it. They can alter the pH of an environment within the active site, the area of an enzyme that binds to a substrate. Uh, they bring substrates together or they bring uh, reactants together in the correct orientation in order for a uh, reaction, a spontaneous reaction to move forward more quickly. Now, enzymes uh, are the key components of metabolic pathways, and down here at the bottom, we have an example of a simple metabolic pathway. We have a starting compound that enters and reacts with enzyme A. This enzyme will cause some kind of change to that molecule or that uh, compound, and that compound will then, as a product of that reaction, become intermediate A. Intermediate A is now the specific substrate or reactant for enzyme B. The product of enzyme B and intermediate A is intermediate B. Intermediate B will now be the substrate for enzyme C, and enzyme C gives us our final end product of the metabolic pathway. So enzymes are these steps. They are the changing, uh, they uh, cause the changing configuration of the molecules that are moving through these metabolic pathways. Now, there are a lot of different factors that contribute to the function of an enzyme, but the most important is its three-dimensional shape. The three-dimensional shape of an enzyme, uh, since it's a protein, this is the tertiary structure if it's a single polypeptide or quaternary if it's a, a more than one polypeptide. But that three-dimensional shape is uh, key or critical to the function of the enzyme. In the case of enzymes and proteins, function um, is completely and totally related to the shape, to the three-dimensional shape of the molecule. However, uh, enzymes can be denatured, and this can occur through a change in temperature, a change in pH, or through competition. Now remember, enzymes have substrates. So um, we have to regulate the uh, activity of these enzymes. Now pH, uh, either highly acidic or highly alkaline, anything uh, in, the, in, in a cell that's kind of away from 
neutral, far away from neutral. The farther away from neutral you get, the more likely this dr drastic change in pH is going to denature an enzyme or a protein. Heat is also very often uh, causes permanent denaturation. Think about if you uh, bake a potato, you can't unbake a potato. And the heat that you introduce to that potato by baking it is what caused the conformational change from the hard potato to a nice soft baked potato. Inhibitors are molecules that can be temporary regulators of enzymes. And this occurs within the actual metabolic pathways themselves. And what enzymes are involved in pathways oftentimes determines the final function of that pathway. They can start and stop pathways, these in, uh, inhibitors. Okay? These are uh, chemical compounds. Oftentimes we would think of these as a pharmaceutical or drug, or it could be the end product of a pathway. Uh, so we can start and stop pathways or um, start and stop actual enzyme activity itself. If, we, if the cell regulates it, this is known as cell regulated, we can drug re regulate it with medications or it can be environmentally regulated through changes of uh, pH, temperature, and different energy sources, sources such as ATP or GTP. Here on the right is just an example of glycogen. We store glycogen in liver and muscle cells, but they get used differently in each of those. The liver is, is going to take glycogen and break it down into glucose molecules to, um, to uh, send that out into the bloodstream for other cells to use. Whereas in um, muscle cells, muscle cells will break down glycogen for a really quick and rapid energy supply. Um, that glycogen will be broken down into glucose and used in the actual muscle cell itself. This is all, both of these uh, reactions are both using glycogen and they're both using it in an environmental response known as the fight or flight or sympathetic nervous system. But how they are using the glycogen is different. And it's different because there are different enzymes in these pathways. So let's take a look at inhibition. We know that temperature and pH can uh, denature or cause changes in uh, enzymatic function, but inhibitors are really kind of the big key. Now in types of inhibition and, and regulation, let's talk about inhibiting proteins first. If we inhibit an enzyme, we can do this by competing with the actual substrate. Many medications can do this. The example um, I pulled up for you is penicillin. Penicillin is an antibiotic that's effective against gram-positive organisms, and penicillin competes with the substrate the cell would normally use. This is our substrate right here. Um, normally, this substrate would fit with the enzyme transpeptidase, but instead, penicillin binds to the transpeptidase active site and directly competes with the substrate for that enzyme. And by out-competing it, the enzyme, when it binds to this inhibitor, cannot carry out its function because this is not the right molecule. Uh, however, um, this is not always permanent. So this uh, molecule, this penicillin molecule, may, weigh down, uh, may uh, break down or uh, fall apart or get removed later. So um, competitive inhibition is substrate concentration dependent. So we have to make sure that there's enough penicillin in the system to outcompete the substrate. We have to have more penicillin than substrate available so that we can bind all of the enzymes that are involved in this reaction. In non-competitive inhibition, I am enzyme concentration dependent. And uh, in this case, I'm not competing with the substrate. Here, the substrate can, can uh, gain access to that active site. However, I have bound my inhibitor somewhere else on the enzyme. This is known as an allosteric site. Now, by binding to an allosteric site somewhere else on the enzyme, I cause a conformational change, a change in shape to the protein. If I change the shape of the protein, the protein will no longer function. This active site right here is no longer the correct shape for my substrate to bind, so it can no longer bind. The example here is cyanide. Uh, cyanide binds to a protein found in our electron transport chain called cytochrome C oxidase, and by binding to cytochrome C oxidase, it turns off our ability to produce uh, large amounts of ATP. 
So our cells will eventually die because they will not be able to produce ATP for cellular function. So cyanide, although not a medication, um, it is a toxin and this, that's how cyanide works. It binds to cytochrome C oxidase. So that's competitive, right? So our concentration dependency is in respect to the substrate and in non-competitive inhib inhibition, our concentration is in respect to the enzyme, okay? to the enzyme itself. How much enzyme is in there? And those, uh, those numbers are often used in determining uh, uh, dosages if this were medications. But most cells and bacterial cells regulate their metabolic pathways themselves. And they do this through a process known as feedback inhibition. Now, feedback inhibition has two different functions or two different ways of inhibiting a metabolic pathway. Uh, the example here is the tryptophan. Bacteria produce their own tryptophan, an amino acid that is used in protein production. But if they are making proteins, uh, biosynthesis of proteins is occurring and they don't need any more tryptophan, there's no reason for these uh, bacteria to continue producing all these enzymes that are responsible for tryptophan production. So once tryptophan concentrations within the cell start to come up and we get uh, more tryptophan than the cell needs, the cells are going to want to turn off the biosynthetic process that produces that tryptophan. Now they can do this one of two ways. They can do this um, in what's known as uh, post-translational control Remember from the last unit, translation is protein production. So we're going to, in this case on the left here, our feedback inhibition is going to be at the protein level. And in this form of inhibition, here is our tryptophan molecule. The tryptophan molecule, if you follow the purple arrow, is going to come over here and it's going to allosterically bind to enzyme 1. This is a form of non-competitive inhibition. So post-translational or protein level control is carried out through non-competitive inhibition. The second way that this could be regulated is post-transcriptional. -trans uh, In post-transcriptional, uh, that's a long word. In post-transcriptional, instead of regulating at the enzyme level, I come over here, we follow the, um, the blue arrow here, and I instead regulate the expression of the gene itself so that I don't even necessarily make the mRNA. I turn off the gene. Um, uh, another example is this from like last uh, unit, we talked about the lac operon. If I wanted to turn off the lac operon, I could simply take away uh, lactose. If I take away the lactose, then the repressor will bind to the, the operator of the gene and it will turn off the gene and it will turn off the operon. Well, the same thing can occur here in the tryptophan, um, in our uh, what's called the trip operon. And in the trip operon, we can, when uh, tryptophan is bound to what's known as the inducer, the enzyme that turns on, the transcription factor that turns on tryptophan, uh, the tryptophan operon, when tryptophan binds to it, it actually shuts it off. So it works the opposite as the lactose and lac uh, repressor. So that would be uh, post-transcriptional. Many of the enzyme-catalyzed reactions that occur in a cell, such as those involved in the biosynthesis of an amino acid, are carried out in a specific sequence called a biochemical pathway. In such pathways, the product of one reaction becomes the substrate for the next reaction. If the end product of a pathway, such as an amino acid, becomes available in the environment, it is unnecessary and wasteful for the cells to continue to produce the product. Cells, therefore, have the ability to shut down a pathway when it is not needed. In feedback inhibition, the end product of the pathway reacts with the first enzyme that is unique to the pathway. The reaction occurs at a site on the enzyme that is different from the active site, called the allosteric site. When the product binds to the allosteric site, the enzyme undergoes a conformational change and can no longer react with its substrate. There is no substrate for subsequent steps in the pathway, and the final product is no longer synthesized.
Many of the enzyme catalyzed reactions that occur in a cell. Hey, sorry about that. Try to get this uh, video to move forward. So that's just an animation. You can find that animation in your textbook. So here's just a quick review, a couple of questions. Uh, you definitely want to write these down and perhaps answer these questions so that you can go through what we just talked about on how enzymes function and regulation of enzymes and metabolic pathways within cells so that um, when you get to the exam, you'll be familiar with those concepts. So thanks for watching part two, and I will see you all in part three.